Good evening, welcome to the Monday, April 8th, 2019 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, the clerk is uh, away today, so uh, the manager will read the roll. Chairman James Jamie Garvin. Here. Councilor Valerie Devereaux. Here. Councilor Jeremy Gabrielson. Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Here. Councilor Valerie Randall. Here. And Councilor Christopher Straw. Here. Thank you. Would you all please rise and join in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, in liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, are there any counselors that have any reports or correspondence they'd like to mention at this time? Councilor I um, am part of the uh, Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation System. It's called PAX. I'm smiling. Uh, we just had a project advisory committee last meeting last Friday to talk about the big vision of transportation in southern Maine. It's an 18-month project, and I'm uh, super excited to be representing Cape Elizabeth in this. I'll give you more updates. Right now, it's just sort of a visioning and seeing where we're going with uh, transportation in southern Maine. So it's pretty exciting. Super. Any questions for Valerie? Councilor Randall? Um, I just wanted to note for everyone watching and those here today that um, I'm the delegate to the Maine Municipal Association Le Legislative Policy Committee. Um, and we review a lot of the bills that are for before the legislature. Um, and I do my best to assess whether those would be in the interest of the town or not. But if anyone has input on a particular bill, I'm happy to um, speak with you or hear from, hear from uh, residents who might be interested in voicing their concerns or um, their voicing whether they're in favor of something. Thank you for that reminder. Any other reports or correspondence from anybody? Seeing none, we'll move on to the Finance Committee report. Councilor Straw. So uh, at the end of March, we held our first two town council budget workshops where we went through the municipal budget. Um, in addition to that, uh, for the current month, everyone should have their financial committee um, dashboard and their appropriation control, the expense distribution, the revenue control, and the revenue distribution. Uh, does anyone have any questions on any of those? Um, seeing none. Uh, moving on. So uh, our next budget uh, meetings for the town council, I believe the next one's going to be April 24th when we'll be receiving the school board budget presentation, which we'll then be discussing at that point. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple issues or a couple items of note in the uh, current municipal budget, um, which I'm sure we'll, we'll be covering. It's probably in the manager's uh, report here. Uh, so we're currently still, uh, we're budgeting conservative conservative with respect to local revenue sharing coming from Augusta, in my opinion. There's currently four different bills working their way through Augusta relating to local revenue sharing. So that remains a big open item which will potentially swing the budget uh, one way or the other by potentially a couple hundred thousand dollars. We'll see what comes about with that. Um, and obviously nothing's still etched in stone with respect to the school funding that will come out of Augusta. So there are big unknowns in the budget. Um, and I don't want to steal the town manager's thunder as to the progress from the workshop, so with that, I'll just wrap it up. <laughs> Great. Any questions for Councilor Straw? Seeing none, uh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak to something not on tonight's agenda? If you could come forward to the podium right now. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bruce Valerity. I'm from Augusta and I'm involved with the Spirit of America Volunteer Recognition Program. Spirit, no, let me back up. Maine is do great things to help uh, others, including the youth who raised $275 from hot chocolate sales to buy needy kids Christmas toys, and the police officer who saved the lives of two youths as their home was engulfed in flames. However, it often happens that people like this who do great things to help their communities do not get public recognition they deserve from their local officials 
or from anyone else. Now, Spirit of America Foundation is a 501c3 public charity established in Augusta to encourage and promote volunteerism. And it allows the Spirit of America Foundation tribute to be presented in the name of any main municipality to honor a person, project, or group <coughs> for outstanding community service. Last year, over 160 main municipalities picked a recipient of this award. Municipalities typically honor the recipient at their annual town meeting or in the month of April, but they're welcome to do it at any other time. Now, Maine Mis Municipal Association and its current president, Mary Sabins, are very supportive of this program. You can find information, a reference to the program, on the MMA website under recent announcements. And also there was mention of the program in the MMA this month, January email newsletter. Incidentally, Mary's hometown of Vassalboro has been involved in this program for many, many years. Now, important point, there is no fee whatsoever to participate in this program. And there's a lot of information about it on the website, spiroaft.com slash gems. And you can find a reference to that website on the handouts that were so kindly distributed to you. Okay? Now, the way the program works is that uh, the Spirit of America winner that Cape Elizabeth would select this year uh, will be honored at a Cumberland County ceremony. Last year, Cape Farm Alliance, which as you know has done beautiful things to help your community, was honored at the October 10 Cumberland County ceremony. And what is supposed to happen is that, and it was supposed to happen last year, was that your town council, instead of Spirit of America Foundation's main chapter was the one who should have picked, up, you should have picked the recipient instead. Okay, we're in a brand new year, clean slate. The deadline is June 30th, so your town council still has plenty of time to pick the local person, project, or group uh, to honor uh, with the Spirit, with the Cape Elizabeth Spirit of America tribute for outstanding community service using your own criteria. So that gives you lots of flexibility. I'm here now in your presence. What, any questions that you might have that I'd be able to answer at this time? I know Matthew has heard some, explained, he's heard some feedback from other communities who they were going to be choosing and so forth. So that's a, another really good resource for you going forward. Okay, any questions you can think of while I'm here? Fire away. <laughs> so. Any questions for Mr. Flaherty? No. Um, we spoke before the meeting. I, I want to thank you for bringing this up and bringing the topic forward. Certainly something for us to consider at a future um, upcoming meeting, probably a workshop discussion. So uh, thank you for, again, making us aware of the opportunity and for um, describing it here for everybody tonight. Appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizens wishing to speak on something not on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to the manager's monthly report. Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I'll begin my report this evening uh, with informing the council of the passing of John Crayford. He was a member of our zoning board of appeals. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Mr. Crayford for his service to the town, as well as to extend our sympathies to, to his family. 
For three weeks in March, you'll notice that the tax collector town clerk's office area was under construction. Uh, that was for long planned renovation work. I'm happy to say that that, now, that work is now complete and our staff is back in place and they're happy about that. I'd like to thank the citizens for their patience and willingness to perform their transactions in their temporary collection area during the project. I would also like to thank Deborah Lane and the tax office staff for uh, their patience and uh, willingness to work through this, our facilities department for heading up the pro project and our technology department for assisting in the project and providing a lot of our technological upgrades that needed to take place. But lastly, I'd like to thank Zach Howe Construction, who is the same firm that did the work on the library. They did a great job in completing this renovation work. I, I hope folks uh, get, to get a chance to take a look at that. And as they, uh, We had a lot of traffic last week with the second half tax bills being due, and it was positively received. So those are their tax, your tax dollars at work. The Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth Police Department has had a very busy spring and they had a well attended Coffee with a Cop event at Sea Salt. It was a huge success and uh, to the extent that you should expect future events to be planned. Uh, it's a uh, part of the outreach that uh, Chief Fenton is trying to instill and, and move forward with. And I think he was frankly overwhelmed with the positive response and the amount of folks who came out. It was great. Uh, also no, notable, the prescription drug take back event is planned for April 27, 2019 from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. at the police department. However, if that date and time do not work for you, uh, please know that uh, you can bring unwanted prescription medications to the police department Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. and they'll, they'll accept them at that time as well. On this evening's agenda is the Coastal Waters and Harbors Ordinance Update, which is a result of the good hard work of the Harbors Committee. On next month's agenda, you should look forward to seeing a request to the Council to grant us permission to pursue a shore and harbor planning grant, which would provide grant funding for planning and design of facilities and improvements for public and working access. Funding cannot be used for construction and will require a 25% match. Uh, we'll have expanded details in this request next month, so please look forward to, to, to seeing that request. And that's, that's what I have this evening, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you very much. Any questions for the manager? See, if, if I may, one last point. Uh, yep. To Councilor Straw's comments about the budget, uh, there is the, the budget section uh, further in the agenda that I thought of tailoring my comments yep. for that. Good news at that point, so okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, we'll move on. Next is the review of the draft minutes from the March 11th regular meeting and the March 18th special meeting. Looking for a motion to approve both sets of minutes. So moved. Councilor Randall first. Okay. Councilor Penny Jordan second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Our next item is a public hearing on, uh, as Matt just mentioned, Chapter 10 of the Coastal Waters and Harbor Ordinance proposed amendments. Uh, anybody wishing to speak on this, if you could come forward to the podium, give your name and address or affiliation, um, and ask that uh, your comments be limited to about three minutes. Is there anybody wishing to speak as part of this public hearing? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Next item is number 63-2019, Ten, Chapter 10, Coastal Waters and Harbor Ordinance Proposed Amendments. Um, Councillor Kate Jordan, do you want to introduce this from your perspective on the Harbors Committee or Councillor Penny Jordan from the Ordinance Committee, either one of you? Go ahead. Do you want to team it? <laughs> All right, we're a good team. Um, Yes, um, what's in front of us is uh, basically a result of recommendation from the uh, Harbors Committee, which uh, had some miscellaneous uh, wording changes, but also added definition from a uh, houseboat and outhaul perspective, along with uh, ordinances that relate to that. And um, um, I think we've reviewed this at a previous workshop and uh, I would move forward that we adopt the changes as uh, submitted by the Ordinance Committee. I'd second that. All right, we have a motion to adopt the amendments as recommended here in the packet, seconded by Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. 
Next up is another public hearing, uh, this on Chapter 13, tra Traffic Regulations at Fort Williams Park. Is there anybody from the public that would wish to speak on this item as part of a public hearing? Seeing none, I'll close that and we'll move to item 64-2019, Chapter 13, Traffic Regulations at Fort Williams Park. As you all know, we've been having ongoing meetings uh, over the last year or so about uh, different aspects of the possibility of uh, establishing parking fees at Fort Williams. We have a number of different items on tonight's agenda that address um, uh, issues related to this larger topic. This is a very specific one uh, where we're recommending ordinance changes that allow simply for the establishment uh, of parking fees uh, should we wish to move forward with that. So um, sort of the uh, ordinance foundational work needed to consider any of the other um, things before they're brought forward. Uh, Council Jordan, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Um, the uh, basically this side, um, this change um, is about creating flexibility um, around um, the rules needed at the park. That the flexibility would be with the town council to um, address things as needed and to um, make changes to any. Um, traffic patterns based on heavy traffic and uh, ensuring the safety. So the, uh, again, we discussed this at a workshop. There haven't been any changes and I'd put forth that we accept this uh, ordinance change as recommended. Is that a motion? That's a motion. We have a motion from Councilor Jordan to adopt the uh, uh, ordinance changes as recommended here. Is there a second? I'll second that one too. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? That's unanimous as well. Thank you. Item number 65 2019. Um, we're looking for initial public comment uh, from anybody on the fiscal 2020 budget. Is there anybody here that would like to offer comment on the 2020 budget? Uh, hi, Nate Perry. Pine Ridge Road, I'm here on behalf of the Cables with Fishermen's Alliance. Um, just sort of got to piggyback on what uh, the town manager mentioned about uh, moving forward with uh, the access repair on Crescent um, and uh, just uh, squeak the wheel on behalf of the Alliance and say that uh, please consider uh, whatever you need to do in the budget in terms of leaving uh, funds for any match or uh, in general for the planning part of that that's going to be coming up. So, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to comment on the budget? Um, we, as Councilor Straw mentioned in his finance report, we have um, a number of upcoming meetings, um, a joint meeting with the school board to review uh, their portion of the budget, uh, followed by public hearing opportunity the first week of May and an, our eventual vote on the municipal budget uh, at our uh, at meeting, I think on the 13th of May. Um, so a number of different opportunities for the public to come forward and both participate in the process and um, voice their opinion. Uh, we welcome that. And and uh, if, you're, if you've got an opinion, um, we'd certainly love to hear it. Seeing nothing else on that, we'll move on to item number 66-2019, Culvert and Habitat Assessment Study. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, I'm gonna turn it over to Town Planner Maureen O'Meara in a minute. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Please. That never happens that easily. Um, so, Paul um, Malley, Public Works Director, is here tonight as well, and um, 
This is a brief presentation on a study that was done by the Public Works Director, myself, and our town engineer, Steve Harding. And I want to start by saying that the vast majority of this work was really done by Steve and his team and Bob, who crawled into every single culvert in the study. Um, and I was able to collect all that information. But it was, it was a very interesting project for all of us. And I do need to recognize that this was funded by a grant from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Maine Coastal Program, and the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry Municipal Planning Assistance Program. So this is one of those grants that we've acquired, uh, $15,000 from those entities, and uh, I think it was $2,000 in cash from the town and in-kind services. And we received a lot of assistance from the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve um, and also some partnering from the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership. Um, how did we get going on this study? Well, um, the Wells National Estuary Reserve, and for that, that's Jake Aman, he approached the town early in last year and was really trying to find out if we were interested in doing any culvert replacements as part of our regular budget. And he was encouraging towns to look at habitat when we're starting to plan for that uh, culvert replacement. Uh, what came out of that was um, him showing us this example here, which you can see in a lot of different places, where you have the normal um, stream rolling through, going under a culvert, and coming out the other side. And then you see these little areas that are just like bites out of the side of where the culvert is outletting. And what that's showing you is you have undersized culverts and you've got a lot of water that is moving around and it's basically wearing away the habitat area adjacent to the culvert. And that's why uh, wildlife professionals are interested in trying to partner with towns. This is a picture of Sawyer Road, but you can look at other places and find the same example. Uh, so what happened was uh, Jake hooked us up with the Maine Coastal Program, and we ended up with this grant. Uh, we used the bulk of the money to hire Sebago Technics, town engineer, to do an assessment of 16 culverts in the town. And we, we put a stakeholder group together. Uh, we met, uh, we looked at habitat, and we mined Bob Malley's extensive knowledge of the town's infrastructure and came up with a list of 16 culverts, uh, created a, a form, and Bob Malley and Steve Harding and some of his team uh, actually visited every single one of those culverts. Um, the map is here, and you have a, a study that shows you all of the culverts. We're going to focus on the top six. So that's culvert number two, which is on Shore Road by Dyer Pond Road. Culvert number three, which is on Route 77 um, by Trout Brook. And Trout Brook plays a big role in this because Trout Brook is an urban impaired watershed and we have a decent number of culverts. And then to the east, we have culvert number eight, which is uh, Trout Brook and Spurwink Ave. And then to the west, we have culvert number 12, which is Trout Brook and Eastman Road. Uh, we're looking at two more. Uh, one of them is culvert number nine, and this is Mitchell Road and Pond Cove Brook. This is where uh, the Hobstone condominiums are. And then the last one is not in a road. Uh, culvert number 15, which is right here, and that is Willow Brook. There's Scott Dyer Road right here. Willow Brook comes down, and this is the major culvert. So um, I'm only going to go over the top six. I know culverts are stun stunning, but so uh, the, one of the best parts about this study was that we had uh, we had a lot of technical assistance from some habitat folks, and Jake is the one that pulled all of this data that is available and kind of screened every one of our culverts. And it's very interesting that some of them have a lot of habitat value, some of them don't have a lot of habitat value. And you've probably noticed that near the back of the study that you all have a copy of, there's a fold-out sheet. And we tried to create a spreadsheet that kind of pulled the highlights out of all of those culvert forms into an at-a-glance uh, sheet. And you can go down through the habitat column and see where some culverts actually have a lot of things going on for habitat, and some really don't. 
um, components of the study. The field visits was critical. Uh, we picked the top six and there were some hydraulic analyses that were done by our town engineer and then based on those hydraulic analyses con some conceptual improvements were designed and those are in an appendices and then based on those improvements, cost estimates. Um, and then finally we did some priority setting because some of them, uh, some of these culverts are actually in pretty good shape and we don't really need to be thinking about replacing them anytime soon. And then there are some that uh, probably deserve some work. So the top six that I'm gonna show you uh, briefly, this is the Shore Road at Dyer Pond Road and if you can see this crack in the road right here, that's where the culvert is. And this right here is proof that Bob Malley was actually standing in and measuring these culverts. Um, this is the inlet, um, and you can see the, the, the stone wall is in pretty good shape above it. This is the outlet, and uh, Bob, if you want to jump in with any of these narratives, come on down. Um, and then this one has another one. You can see that there's a, a little bit of rock moving on the head wall, but generally this culvert's not in bad shape, so it, it didn't get rated as something that we needed as a high priority for improvement. Um, then we have our culvert number three. This is the Ocean House Road. I'm going to give you the pair. This is um, the, the major culvert on Ocean House Road just as you're crossing into South Portland. It's an enormous culvert. You can see it's got this big concrete wall. Great picture you can see going all the way through. Um, not in bad shape, but you can see the, the stones up here starting to move down into the brook, which is not good. Um, so this was rated as for medium priority. That means that maybe sometime in the next five to ten years we need to look at, it, at, at improving this. Interesting, it's 54 feet long and there was a question, would, would habitat, would critters be willing to go through that long dark tunnel? And the answer was probably not a problem. Uh, this next culvert, we're staying with the Trout Brook theme. This is to the east of the culvert we were just looking at. This is on Spurwink Ave, again, right near the South Portland border. And again, you can see, you know, there's a lot of vegetation on both sides of the culvert, and that's good. You can start to see some rocks that are in the stream. So um, overall, not in bad condition as well. Uh, this is the other side of Trout Brook, and this is Eastman Road, recently paved. You can see this little blue sign here. This is telling you that this is an urban impaired stream, and that's pretty much where the culvert is. Um, and again, this culvert, it's, it's a little discolored, but the, the information is that that's not really an indication that it's in bad shape. You can see it's very vegetated on the outlet side. So again, it didn't get rated um, high or medium priority for improvement. Okay, now we're on Mitchell Road. And um, this is the location of Mitchell Road. There's a pump station right here. Um, this is um, Hobstone Road, right in the same intersection. This culvert's not in great shape. You can see on the inlet side, you've got stones that are in, in the brook. On the outlet side, this is a hanging culvert. So the culvert bed, the bottom of the culvert should actually be embedded in the ground and instead you can see the water pouring out. So uh, this is a very old culvert. It's one of the oldest in the study. And it's also challenging because there are sewer lines here. So whenever we replace this culvert, we're gonna have to figure that out. The main concern is this area right here. Um, it really should be a much more naturally vegetated area and there's a lot of concern that this, this is not great for habitat or for the, the, the um, health of the stream. Um, okay. And the winner is number 15, Willowbrook. This is the culvert that is south of, Spur, of excuse me, Scott Dyer Road. And this is what it looks like from the top. There's a sewer line in there. Actually, there's two sewer lines. We use it as a Greenbelt Trail. It gets mowed every year. It looks perfectly nice from up above. Um, downstream, you can see that there's the Spurwick Marsh right there. So barely 200 feet away from this culvert um, is the Spurwick Marsh. And running across the top of the culvert are two sewer lines. So the bottom of the culvert is deteriorated badly. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen to those sewer lines if these culverts completely fail, uh, but it doesn't look good. So this was the number one high priority for replacement. 
Um, high priority we identified as replacement between one to four years. Number one, the winner was Willowbrook, uh, estimate at 275,000. The second high priority is that Mitchell Road culvert, uh, again, at a gross estimate of 315,000. And then we have, uh, we know we have problems with Sawyer Road. The, wa the road is overtopped multiple times a year with flooding. Uh, we currently are doing a separate study on Sawyer Road. It was originally included in this study, but it's got a lot of tidal influence, and it was just impossible to fund that analysis and do the other work. So again, we got some assistance from Jake and the Maine Coastal Program, and we're, we're, we're in the midst of doing that second study just for Sawyer Road right now. And then uh, medium priority, which we defined as five to 10 years from now, we have Ocean House Road at Trout Brook, 320,000, Spurwink Ave at Trout Brook, 270,000. So you can see that we're looking at in the first one to four years, about $600,000 in investment in culvert. And then the next five to 10 years, probably another 600,000 investment in culverts. So, uh, what do we get out of this? Well, we know how to look at culverts now. We have this great form. We can send people out there. Uh, we have the at glance table, which we're hoping is a good reference for you as you move forward and do capital improvement planning. We have incorporated this ha habitat evaluation, which we don't usually do for infrastructure investment. Uh, we do have an idea conceptually of what the cost would be, and we've got this ongoing partnership with habitat groups, which helps us with the analysis, but they also have been helping us with identifying funding and that's all. Any questions? Questions for Maureen? Maureen, I have a question. How, how long are these things supposed to last? Or some of those ones that are in the high priority state, how long have they been around? It really depends on the composition of the culvert. The HDB culverts or plastic culverts have a much longer lifespan. We have some that are corrugated metal where the bottoms will fail, so some are concrete, those have a much longer lifespan, so it really depends on the type of material. But the HDPE, I'm not sure if there is a life. You know, if it's exposed to sunlight, uh, it can have a, an impairment uh, issue with that, but uh, as long as they're bedded properly and installed properly and they're plastic, they have a long lifespan. Some of these ones that are high priority, how, how old are they, do you know? The oldest one I think we identified was Mitchell Road at Ponco Brook. And, it predates the sewer project of 1975. We really don't have an installation date, but that's probably the oldest one. The Willowbrook culverts, which were rated number one, were replaced in 1983 in that area. So long life. Long life. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious. Um, so projecting out the amount of capital that we would we'll be looking to replace um, based on this study, how does that compare with what we would otherwise be looking to budget around culvert replacements? Well, I think what we learned from this exercise is that we needed to budget for these uh, uh, infrastructure replacements. We, I think we were addressing things on sort of a short uh, window notice or something was failing, we had to add, you know, pursue it and replace it uh, on a much shorter notice than we normally would. But I think what this does is it gives us a plan moving forward to assist the council on how we're going to fund these and to plan for those in the future, if that answers your question. Yeah, no, that, that's that's helpful. Um, and I'm just curious on the cost estimates, um, if those are based, what what sizing those are based on, or based on an initial projection on the amount of flow, or how, how those cost Those are based on, it's, it's modeling done by uh, our engineering firm, and. I think we've got a 25% contingency or something built into that. So those are those are estimates uh, based on computer modeling of typical cost. The other thing we did, and if you look at that at a glance table, you can see BFW bank full with. I learned a lot of terms during this talk. Um, we've got state standards now that we're not looking just at how much water can move through the culvert, but installing infrastructure that isn't a habitat barrier. So the new standard is really the width of the water body you're trying to span plus a foot on each side. So it's 1.2 bank full width. And that's what's driving the cost because we are have to buy a bigger structure than we would if we're just thinking about flow. The other thing we need to do is we need to embed the structure in the ground. So we're looking at losing one to two feet because we want to have a gravel base once you put that in. So you're buying bigger structures than you would buy 40 years ago. Get that? 
Um, lastly, I want to thank Maureen for her efforts on this. She's the one that really got it off the ground here and filled out the grant applications and um, put together the report. So she didn't give herself enough credit, but uh, I'd like to, to recognize that. And I think, you know, as I told you, I think last week at the, or last month at the budget hearing, this was a very val valuable exercise. I think sometimes we took or take our infrastructure for granted that everything's flowing underneath the road as we drive over it. And uh, it was a good exercise to climb down and measure these culverts and to see them. And, and some were fine and some were not so fine. So it was a, a productive uh, exercise and I'm glad we did it. So. I, I agree. I've seen a number of towns look at culverts throughout their municipalities, and this is a great approach that I think balances the habitat needs with the fiscal planning very well. Um, so great work to okay. everyone involved. Thank you. And another um, plug for Jake Amon, who really uh, assisted us, met with us, has been a very valuable resource and very cooperative, and, and is helping us you know, explore some grant opportunities mm -hmm. to help fund uh, the replacement of these, such as the Willowbrook Cove. Yeah, I, I, and if I could, I just had two more, hopefully quick questions. Sure. Um, on the um, Troutbrook um, stream culverts, is there an opportunity, or being in an urban impaired watershed, is there, are there funding associate, funding um, opportunities associated with that, or are, those, are there particular culverts on here that we'd be looking at as part of our overall um, municipal stormwater obligations? I'm just curious. Uh, the main DEP has some funding opportunities that we could explore, but uh, some of these are probably going to have to be funded 50% you know, or more by the town. And, and my last one, <laughs> I'm just curious about the Willow Brook culvert. Um, I know from spending time walking down there that that's pretty close to uh, the current high tide mm -hmm. area. It's a lot of freshwater vegetation right next to it, but it's right about at that elevation. Are there any issues or concerns um, associated with salt water moving farther up into the watershed as, as a result of enlarging that culvert, or is that something we need more engineering? Uh, we yeah, we need to investigate that more. There's funds that are proposed in the fiscal 2020 budget to perform preliminary engineering for that project. Uh, very concerned about the condition of those culverts. As Maureen said, there's sewer lines that are over those particular culverts. Um, and then the sea level rise, obviously taking that into impact, and, uh, and the level of uh, tidal action in the marsh itself. So we'll, I think our primary concern is just the conditions of the culverts and what happens if they fail. So. Thank you. Thank you very well. Very nicely done. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Councilor Deborah? Uh, Councilman Gabrielson asked some of my questions. I'm really concerned about the funding. Also, it looks like on, uh, I think it was Spur Spurwing, where there's the big cracks in the road now because of the culverts underneath. Is that something that could be um, funded also with highway funds or state because it is impacting the road also? Well, you're going to see those seams in the culvert. That, that's a little bit natural. That might occur just because of freeze thaw cycles, uh, the trench itself. Some of those represent where the pipe was replaced. So, Maureen mentioned the one Shore Road at Diapong. We've actually replaced that since the road was paved. Uh -huh. So, when we repaved the road, we had two natural joints on either side. So, but you might see some cracking, some the reflective cracking on some mm -hmm. of these pipes, and that's probably just freeze thaw action that's happening over time. Okay, but it, but there's no safety issues with it. No, no, no. Really, the issue is giving the council just that long-term awareness of the funding needs that we're going to need to address these in the future. And then who? Would Maureen, would it be you? Who would look into additional funding sources? Uh, we're, we're actually partnering on that. So um, I think Bob is doing more of this is the highest priority right now, and um, I'm working more on identifying resources. And I mean, honestly, some of these are going to compete really well for grant money. Mm -hmm. And in those situations, we're probably still going to have to come up with 50% of the match. Um, in other places, we may not compete very well, and the, the culvert replacement is really going to be coming out of the town's capital improvement budget. So 
you know, we're, I, my, my philosophy is to be opportunistic. When there's money available for something that is a relatively high priority, you should go after it. And then sometimes you just have a situation where you just cannot wait any longer, and you're going to have to do something about it, whether or not funding is available. So I think we're kind of that's the way we're thinking. We're going to take advantage of opportunities as they present themselves, and still provide you with good recommendations to avoid emergency situations. I think I think the Willowbrook culvert has some good potential to get some funding for that. And through Jake, I uh, suggested that. Uh, because of its condition, because of the location next to the marsh, that there was a good possibility we could get some assistance with that. Well, I'm thinking, what about um, Nature Conservancy or some of the, uh, the fish? We have the trout, we have different wildlife, maybe there's other funding that way. Even the state, if we're looking at um, some of this due to tidal issues or climate change? Okay. I think the, the, the benefit was having the stakeholders as a group working on this, because it had, they had a seat at the table and it made them sort of aware of the, the program. I think if just town staff initiated this, went through it, it wouldn't have raised the awareness with some of the outside groups to help us with funding for this, okay. if that happens. That's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, uh, could I have a motion to uh, accept the report as presented uh, with thanks and gratitude to the uh, staff and team that worked on it? So Councilor Devereaux, is there a second? Councilor Gabrielson, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Next up is item number 67-2019, update on uh, rescue fees. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, Chief Gleason, would you like to update us on this, please? In front of you, you have the memo prepared that reviews our current rates and our proposed rates. We haven't uh, reviewed them for four years, and in speaking with Sean McPherson, who was our representative, from our billing company. We contract all our rescue billing out to a firm called Medical Reimbursement Services. And we looked at the comparison rates for eight different services and we were towards the low end. So we're recommending the, the increases that are outlined on here moving forward. And if you have any questions on that. Any questions for Chief Gleason? Good. Good. Count, Count I was just curious about the collectible amount with the 40%. Does that mean that only 40% of the... It's based on 65-70% uh, of our customers or transports are either Blue Cross, Main Care, or Medicare, and they set their rates. We can charge anything we want, and they'll, they pay what they want. So that certainly impacts if there was all at private insurance paying them our maximum fees, we would be collecting significantly more. But... Main care and med Medicare, you have to enter into agreements with them that you agree to their rates. And there is legislation going forward in Augusta to force Main care to re raise its rates, but you know the outcome of that I'm not sure of. So we didn't want to project revenues that we didn't, couldn't guarantee. Councilor Jordan? Are these the numbers that are reflected in the budget this year? At this point, no, Councilor Jordan. Uh, Okay. After speaking with the chief and uh, speaking with the, 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 our billing company, they estimate that uh, we should probably wait until the second year until we can see what the impact is okay. going to be this year, just okay. uh, for safety's sake, because as, as chief said, the majority of our runs are either, they're, they're on fixed numbers, so you can set it at whatever you want, you're so only going to get paid so much. <laughs> so it's a question of understanding that difference between the private pay, and which is a, a low low percentage of our overall client base, if you will. And so after one year of knowing this, we'll have a stabilized number, we'll have a better thought as to as to where we're going. Right now we're tracking some. Their estimates, they were looking at maybe, you know, ranging from seven to $20,000 more. So they said it's really, you want to have another year to, to estimate. So we, they didn't plug those numbers into there just out of a cautionary state. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions for Chief Gleason? Councilor Randall? I'm just curious, what are the rates in the surrounding communities? It, they ranged anywhere. Uh, I think uh, York was the highest that we saw, which for an ALS run was $2,150. Uh, 
to um, it was Buck, no, it wasn't Buxton. It was I can't I can't remember the topic. It was like Keysner Falls or something was only charging seven hundred dollars. But the thing that, that's different now is with the per diem program, almost every one of our transports involves an ALS provider. So we're doing more ALS treatments than we used to do. Um, basic life support is, you know, taking your blood pressure, your pulse, your oxygen level, and, and basically, you know, a me quick medical assessment, whereas ALS is introducing IVs, drugs, uh, EKGs, that sort of things, and all those raise, raise the rates up. And, Surprisingly, probably 70, 75 percent of our runs are now ALS runs, so we're billing at the higher rate there. So it just—it's a wide variety. And some charge. We used to do a thing called a, a menu, so based on the services, was how much your charge was. It was very difficult to project what our revenues would be. So we've gone to these fixed things, and some services are doing the fixed, and some are still doing the menu. So it's—it's it's not always apples to apples to compare to other services. We, our collection rate is, is one of the better in the area, so that, you know, that, that certainly helps our revenues. But well, we're sort of, right now, we're towards the lower end. I would like to get more towards the middle to the high end. Will this bring us towards the middle or high yeah, closer end? Closer to the higher end. We'll be above the middle and below the high, so okay. it's a good middle ground. Matt, you want to add something? If I may, Chief, uh, Chief was kind enough to give you some information on this the other day. So, of the six different towns that were that were looked at uh, on the advanced life support of the ALS run that he was that the chief had referenced, the low was nine hundred eighty-five dollars. The high was twenty-one hundred and fifty. Uh, majority, or, or uh, two of the six were at a thousand. One was at, uh, and two were at eighteen hundred in the high end, and the you know then the low end. So at a thousand dollars on the ALS run. We're, we're pretty much catching up with uh, with the other other communities that were in the study. Uh, so um, with the proposed fees, we're, we're covering our costs, I assume? No, no. the town's still sub so the majority of the rescue budget is funded from the fees and probably what, a third is come direct from tax. Yeah, uh, roughly. So the, uh, uh, that's interesting. So, uh, um, so as it stands, we're relative, it sounds like we've been relatively low and the taxpayers have been subsidizing the program, which obviously has benefit to all the taxpayers. Um, we're the proposal is to move it up a little bit more, which will still be subsidizing it, but not as much. So we're kind of sharing the burden with the people using the service. Yes. And um, so looking at this, it looks like you do about two, two and a half runs a day. Is that right? Yeah, we're at 2.8 almost right. now. All right. And it's the strangest thing to predict. Last year, Tuesday was our busiest day of the week. Can't understand that for any reason. And, and next year, it may be a different day. But Mondays and Tuesdays are usually popular because people have waited for the weekend and don't want to go to the hospital on the weekend. So Monday and Tuesday are usually our busier days. But there's no rhyme or reason to the volume that I can figure out anyway. Chivana, thank you for pulling this proposal together. Um, I think this looks like a reasonable proposal. Um, assuming we move forward with this tonight, what would you recommend um, as a time frame for, look, you said it had been about four years since we reviewed the rates. Is that is that a, a normal time frame, or how often should we be looking I at I talked to uh, Sean McPherson who, from our medical reimbursement company, and I think we'll do it annually, just to make sure we're staying. And the hard thing, too, is some of those services in the surveys are private that contract with the communities to provide the service, and some are, are municipally, municipal service like ours. So it's, it's kind of difficult to get apples to apples on, the, on some of these comparisons. So. Any other questions for Chief Gleason? Would anybody like to make a motion? I'll move that we um, accept the uh, submission of the um, rate changes for rescue presented before us. The motion. Moved by Councilor Jordan, seconded by Councilor Gabrielson. Any discussion? What's the implementation process? As soon as we get the go ahead from the council, I'll talk to Sean and we'll move the rates up. 
we'll have to, I think we have to publish them on that. We'll put them, we'll change our website and then we'll, you know. Uh, yeah, that's right. I didn't know if, what, what level of notice needed to be given or anything. Certainly, I don't think we should start before May 1st so that we can get finished out this monthly cycle. So just to be clear, Councilor Jordan, your motion was to accept the recommendation and adopt the new fees. Yes. Correct, thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Gleason. Thank you. Next up is item number 68-2019. We're coming back to a couple of items for Fort Williams here uh, in a row. Uh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item, uh, enforcement of parking fees at Fort Williams Park? Seeing none. Um, again, at our March workshop, we discussed um, some of the ramifications if the town uh, decides to enter into an agreement for pay and display program at Fort Williams, uh, what the uh, needed ordinance changes would be to uh, address the enforcement. Uh, we reviewed the draft that's included in tonight's packet. Um, is there anybody, uh, Councilor Penny Jordan, or anybody else who wishes to add anything else to this before we have our motion? Go ahead. Uh, kind of uh, struggled with what recommendation to make to council as far as what you would like to do. Uh, as you noticed on uh, page, or on the subsequent page, depending upon how you printed it out on item number 68, uh, what I provided in here was a couple of proposed changes for the council to consider. One of there was, uh, was basically inserting uh, the ability for the police chief to uh, duly authorize a, par a parking enforcement agent and then uh, just inserting that language throughout. Uh, I wasn't sure if the level of uh, involvement that the council might want to have if you wanted to re refer this to the ordinance committee for consideration or if you wanted to send this forward, uh, depending upon if the council felt that this was fully baked and ready to go forward to, to set to a public hearing next month if you wanted to, do, you had either, either option. Uh, but I've kind of struggled with which one to, to recommend because it is, I didn't want to step on the ordinance committee's uh, toes, quite frankly. Councilor Jordan? That was gonna be one of my questions as to what the history or precedent is of having to send it to the ordinance committee because it's going to take us, we were looking at the timeline of being able to get this up and running for this summer. And by the time the ordinance committee meets, reads these, but eight lines and a change of maybe a dozen words, and then we bring it back to the council, then we've got to set a public hearing to have these ordinance changes. I think it might just be worthwhile that maybe we look at it as a council who's going to vote on it regardless in the end, and maybe do that tonight, set a public hearing, and then we are on the same timeline that we projected to be on. Other comments, Councilor Randall? Um, I agree with Councilor Jordan's desire to move this along quickly, but just a quick glance, it seems like there's some pretty problematic language in here for enforcement. So I don't know how much workshopping we're up to in this setting. And I, it, maybe it's possible that we could, just as a council workshop it at some, we could squeeze it into the agenda of an upcoming workshop maybe. Is there a current ordinance meeting scheduled? There isn't one there isn't scheduled. One. We didn't have any things on our agenda. So this would be an item that we could put forward and do fairly quickly, I would think. It's just getting the meeting, I think. Right. Scheduled. I mean, with every Once everybody gets back from vacation. Right, so that's what I mean, yeah. But so we're... You're still make either way. You're making it a month out further, because even if we get a meeting in, whether it's a workshop with the council or a workshop with or a meeting with the ordinance committee, you still don't have anything approved to go to a public hearing until next meeting, and then you have to have a month for that public hearing. Then you have to have a month after the public hearing for it to take effect. Right. So I would be willing to sit here and just listen to what some of the things Ms. Randall or Mr. Straw has to say because we just went through this ordinance yeah. yep. the other day. So 
What did we miss? So maybe hear what the suggestions are. Yeah. Can we do that? Councilor Stroh. So I'd like to hear from Councilor Randall. Um, it, to the extent any of the issues that you have are outside of the bolded and underlying text, it, those would be issues with the pre-existing ordinance, I assume? Um, so so I, I, I'd like to hear what, what, what you're looking at and saying, oh, let's look at this. Councilor Randall. So just in terms of translating this, because this was not contemplating at the time it was written that we would have a third party enforcing, um, I don't know the details of the contract with the parking enforcement company, but I think that's something that we need to know before we require that they be authorized by the chief of police. And I, I'd also like to hear from the chief of police as to what that process might look like. Um, and then we also have in this section, the, the dollar amount of the fine shall be set by order of the um, town council. But are, I don't believe we're setting, are we setting the amounts of the fine? I guess, I get, again, that's something that I'd like to know more about the contract with the enforcement agency, how those fines are set. And then the last part refers to payment being received at the public safety building within 30 days after the date of issuance of the ticket. So we, we may just need a whole new section that deals specifically with Fort Williams and not general parking, rather than try to make this work with the Fort Williams parking scheme, just write a new one. Uh, I totally understand that and think that's probably the best bet in the long run, but I'm comfortable going forward with this for the time being to have just something in place. But I, I hear you that we should look at reworking. Um, Other comments? Can Council, I take, uh, Council Devereaux. I, I agree um, with Councillor Straw, I think that, and Councillor Randall. I think that um, there are some issues that need to be reworked, but if we do get it in place now, then we can go ahead and rework it and put in a new, a revised um, ordinance. Councilor Jordan. Just clarification. So what I hear people are saying is uh, move this forward uh, in order to continue to move ahead with um, um, any recommendations around fees for Fort Williams and then um, also submit to the ordinance committee for some sort of uh, rewrite at a later date. That's what I hear. Is that what we're saying? That's what I'm hearing. Okay. Other discussion? Councilor Randall? Um, I think that that's an okay plan, but I think we may have some issues when, if we tried to actually enforce based on this ordinance. So I don't know whether there's a point in actually moving forward with this um, because I don't know that it would do much for us. Except, except allow a duly authorized parking enforcement agent to act, so. Councilor Jordan. Which I think that's what we're after. I think we, I, at least I understood it that we knew going into it that it was kind of wishy-washy on the enforcement to begin with. Like, like, you know, just because the third party writes you a ticket, it's like the true honor system that you're gonna pay it. I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling with which part you're struggling with, that part, the enforcement part, or just the, we can authorize the third party to write the ticket. Um, all of it, I, I guess. <laughs> I think, well, I wonder if it might be problematic with our contract mm -hmm. if we don't have authorization for them to actually enforce because I think that's part of the arrangement in terms of what they get from it. Um, I, I, I want to jump in here. Uh, the, I, I, um, I'd rather do it right than fast. I've been saying that on a number of points as it relates to this item all along. Um, I would note that you know, all of the revenue that we're projecting um, in the fiscal 20 budget, that starts July 1. So anything before that is gravy, which I'm not dismissing. But um, you know, when we look at the, the numbers that we're projecting for parking revenue, uh, that has nothing to do with 
the start of the tourist season or the start of you know anything it's it's in the fiscal 20 budget for right now okay second of all the ca we can work the calendar to solve the problem we, just because we only have you know you know we we're going to be all gathering on may 6th for example we can set a special meeting to if, if the ordinance committee is able to meet before uh you know in that last week of april and and come back to the May 6th agenda. We can set a special meeting. We have then a, a meeting on the 13th where we can then set a, you know, a special public hearing sometime later in May and still be, you know, on track and in alignment here. I'm, I'm less concerned about how we figure out dates and work the calendar than I am about doing this right and not trying to cut corners um, simply because what we have is almost right but not completely right and then we just have to go fix it later that do, that doesn't seem to make sense to me so um go ahead Councilor. I, I also want to add um and that's why i asked for clarification of what people were saying i get um really um nervous about the uh, appearance that we're trying to jam something through rather than do the process as the process needs to be laid out so i will commit to getting the ordinance committee together so that we can address this and put something forward as as soon as we can because i would rather do it right and secondly, I would just say uh, on that, and um, I, I, I don't mean to be, um, I, I'm not, I don't want to diminish people's participation in that or be disrespectful, but um, if, if schedules are such that two people from the committee are able to meet, then and wh wh whatever two people those those people are, then that's quorum for the meeting. You know, we can move forward from that. But um, and similarly for any subsequent. You know, extra meetings that we might have to have, but um, I, I just always get uh, uh, um, frustrated with um, us looking at the calendar we set at the beginning of the year and assuming that that's the only time we can do business. So I think we could figure this out cool. another way. So, um, other discussion? Could I just ask, please, um, Matt? Can you get this in front of Maureen and I'll contact her tomorrow and we can get it rolling. Cool. Thank you. Certainly, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, yep. as well. Uh, if you think about the grand scheme of all the the irons that you have in the fire, this is a, this is a really small. And I'm not downplaying the the uh, the importance of it, but of the of the heavy lifts that you've done up to this point, the earlier item that you have, and then the subsequent item that you have, those are the larger ones. Uh, so I would agree. If you can get that one fine detail in, and where, where the chairman is, is spot on, is you can get this part locked into place, I think, in time to where, where you need to be. Uh, when you consider the heavy lift that you've already, that you, you're already contemplating. So I, I would, I would think a, an abundance of caution wouldn't be a bad thing to do at this point. I, that, that's why I, I had struggled with it at this point to make a recommendation either way. Yeah. So that, that's all I have on that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, the other thing I would ask is that if, if at all possible, to include Chief Fenton in yeah. the meeting, um, the ordinance committee oh, meeting, okay. so that yeah. we're, um, you know, have all the necessary stakeholders involved and can at the very least short circuit that process. So um, unless there's any other discussion, I'm looking for a motion to refer this to the ordinance committee. So moved. Councilor Randall. Second. Second by Councilor Jordan. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great, thank you. Next up is item number 69-2019, Statement of Policy for Revenues Received from Parking Fees at Fort Williams Park. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none. Um, at our uh, recent Town Council workshop, we had, uh, uh, I think, good and fruitful discussion around um, if we are to begin implementing any parking fee scheme at Fort Williams, um, should there be any uh, statement um, or w whether it be a formal policy or, uh, you know, a directive notion or anything like that of w what exactly the revenue derived from, from any such program should be put towards. So before us is a draft that the manager put together. Um, I'll turn it over to Matt to 
maybe go into a little bit more detail of the language you chose here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to. Uh, taking direction from the council at the last workshop, uh, the, the two concepts that uh, that were requested were to be brief, but also flexible. So that's what I've tried to uh, provide with this, knowing full well that I have uh, seven council members who uh, would like to refer this to workshop and 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 clean it up in the direction that you found which, which would work out the best. So uh, in trying to accomplish that, <laughs> I hope I came closer to the mark, but I had uh, generated a statement to say revenues generated by the pay and display parking program at Fort Williams Park will be primarily employed in offsetting the following. The operational expenses at Fort Williams Park, long-term capital needs of the town, and general municipal operating expenses. Trying to hit on uh, three large concepts, but at the same time paying attention to the areas that uh, had been expressed as primary concerns for, for using fees that were generated by the park and looking at it to be self-sustaining, but also providing a, a, an additional amount of revenue for the, for the community. Thank you. Um, so uh, is there a motion to refer that to further discussion at workshop? Moved. Council Randall, is there a second? Council Penny Jordan, any discussion? Great, thank you. Is there uh, all those in favor? Great, thank you. Um, next up on pay and display parking is um, a summary of all the meetings that we've had and discussions that we've had at this point. Um, what the intended action here is to simply set a public hearing uh, for May 6th, but before I do that, is there anyone that right now would wish to speak on this item from the public? Okay, seeing none. Uh, the intent is to simply set a public hearing at our May 6th meeting. Is there a motion? Councilor Jordan? Um, I move that the town council sets a public hearing on charging parking fees uh, through a pay and display program at Fort Williams Park um, um, on May 6, 2019 at 7 p.m. at the town hall. Okay. Is there a second? second. Council Devereaux, any discussion? Um, Council Gabrielson? Clarify. Um, the purpose or the, what we're hoping to hear at the public hearing, so will there be a proposal that the public will be asked to respond to at May 6th, or are we hoping for more comments from the public generally on the concept of pay and display? Um, I think that that's a great question, number one. Uh, number two is that yes, I think the number, is, so it, it coincides with our budget hearing. Um, so the number that Matt is now including in the pro forma and some of the budget protect projections are based off of the current, um, you know, the current proposal that we've been discussing at the most recent workshops um, for both stipulating who the fees would apply to, what the fee is, when they would start, when they would run through, all that kind of thing, who would operate. So the, the, my vision for this public hearing it is a, you know, sort of one-stop shopping opportunity for people to come forward and say, I'm either for or against pay and display parking. I like this plan. I don't think it does this. I think you should consider this, all, you know, all the things. And we've heard from some people in workshops, but it, you know, it's typically at a public hearing that you hear from the most people. Um, and so that's, that's what I would see. But I don't know if anyone else has any other opinion on that or um, would like to see it done differently. Uh, not to be duplicative, but basically much what you just said, we now have a package that includes uh, an RFP that we received a response from. Uh, we've put forward proposed fees. Uh, we've talked about uh, the policy as to where the funds that will be raised, how they would be spent, and then proposed uh, traffic regulations and enforcement. So we basically, we have a package now for people to look at, uh, develop a informed opinion on, and then give us their, their sense of where we think we should go with this. What this program. Um, to that end, I think it would probably be worthwhile, and I'm happy to take on working on this with Matt um, when I'm back the week of the 22nd, but maybe we put together a couple of PowerPoint slides that just are really high-level summary as opposed to the, you know, volumes of pages that we have that we've, we've poured through on this, but that outline, you know, this is, this is what we're talking about here. 
I think that would be helpful. There's a lot of, I mean, just looking at our agenda tonight, there's a lot of moving pieces on this, and some of them are pretty technical and in the weeds. So I think having that high-level summary and really laying out, you know, here's how we're envisioning that this would work at this point would be helpful for um, people to think about what their comments would be. I agree. Other comments? Seeing none, the motion on the floor is to refer this to a public hearing on May 6th. All those in favor? Great, thank you. Next up is item number 71-2019, an easement deed for 51 Ocean House Road. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none. Matt, do you want to tell us about this? I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, if you all recall, uh, roughly about almost a year ago, uh, 51 Ocean House Road was uh, the victim of a, of a bad oh, right. fire, and the house was uh, was demolished. Subsequently, uh, resold to uh, and some investors who were looking to redevelop it, who are currently have a project in front of the planning board uh, to to turn the, the existing one lot into two lots. During the process of doing their investigation, they found that there was an existing public sewer line that appears to encroach on the southerly corner of the parcel. So what we have this evening is an easement deed that's been brought forward from Maxwell Cove LLC uh, for the property of 51 Ocean House Road to make that uh, more le legal, I guess, for, lot, for all intents and purposes. Uh, they brought that forward, we have the deed, and uh, we're ready to go with that, but we would need to have the uh, council's approval to provide an easement deed on that. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the easement deed as requested here uh, for 51 Ocean House Road? So moved. Council Randall, is there a second? Second. Council Penny Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank Great, thank you. Next up is item number 72-2019, Statement of Policy for the Boards and Committees barring the appointment of town employees from serving on standing <coughs> boards and committees. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, Councillor Devereaux, would you like to uh, introduce this? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a uh, request by Councillor Straw that we review a policy that prohibited town employees from serving on boards and committees uh, following a concern expressed by a citizen and a school employee who had applied for a board position um, during the recent annual appointments process. We, uh, I met with uh, town manager Matt Sturgis. We worked on this and then the uh, council workshopped it on March 18th. I think that the uh, policy looks very good and um, I would ask that uh, everybody approve this motion or make a motion and approve our new um, statement of policy. Great. Uh, motion by Council Devereaux to approve the recommended changes to the boards and committees policy. Is there a second? Second. Council Randall, any discussion? Council Straw. Uh, just for number three, the <laughs> it's the which versus the that thing again. Um, the 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 second sentence of uh, bullet three, where it's a witch, we yep. should have a that, but that's it. Which is descriptive, that is restrictive. My way that I look at things grammatically. Right there, should be there. Yeah, it should be that instead of which. Any other discussion? All, right. All those in favor of the motion, including the um, grammar correction? Great, thank you. Next up is item number 73-2019, group uses at Fort Williams Park. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, we have requests from Beach to Beacon, Portland Yacht Club, and American Cancer Society. Dates and details of their events are all noted here, uh, as well as the votes of the Fort Williams Park Commission. Um, we can either do these in block or individually. 
parking block. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve the group uses as noted here on the agenda? So moved. Council Randall, is there a second? Second. Council Jordan, you guys are a tag team tonight. <laughs> Any discussion? So, a question one yep. says additional request. Didn't they do this before? If yep, this is for an additional event they're doing, but um, Matt. What, the, what they've done in the past was held it at an, a, a different location off-site, and so what they're looking to do is uh, add it all, have it all be held on-site now. Uh, they used to hold it, I'm trying to remember where, was it at, uh, I think it was at the pools maybe? Yeah, but this, last year it was at the fort, that's why I was just... No, it was at Candace Cruz. Sorry, that's where it was. Yeah, it had been at the There's pools in the past. There's another special dinner <laughs> yeah. that we don't get to go to. Gotcha. So that that would be why they would be asking for the. Well, if you were an elite customer. athlete, you could go. <laughs> There's never. plenty of time between now and never. Yeah. August first, Caitlin. Turns that status. Get running. So there's the volunteer night, there's then the elite athlete night, and then the race. So the three events at the end of the day. And the VIP thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I, I'm curious. Basically all of the activities have shifted to the fort is yeah. the point. Um, I'm curious, the note on the Portland Yacht Club, Club request that PYC will hire police for overnight, is that use intended to encompass this entire time frame? They'll have a presence in the park, or I'm just curious why that note was included? They, yeah, they, they do overnight because there is a, it's a, it's like a 24 hour race, more, more or less, and they have uh, like a command center that's located there. So if you have somebody in the park, they need to provide uh, security or a higher us to, to be there for them. Any other discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. Next is number 74-2019, setting the warrant for the school budget validation referendum election. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none. Uh, before us is the draft warrant to the uh, police chief. Uh, is there a motion to approve the warrant? So moved. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, is there a second? I'll second it. Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. And next, and our last item of the regular agenda is a, a motion to move into executive session for two purposes. One, number one is to request a request that we have for hardship poverty tax abatement, and the other to continue the evaluation of the town manager. Is there a motion as is written here, please? Well, Councilor Randall? Is this the one where we have to read the motion? Please. Mm -hmm. Um, I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council enter into executive session in conformance with 1 MRS section 4056F to consider a request for a, an abatement of property taxes based on hardship or poverty and 1 MRS section 4056A to continue the annual evaluation of the town manager. Great. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? All those in favor? All right, we'll move into executive session. We have to come out of executive session to with the decision. No, 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 because it's uh.